uh, the uh, public square, obviously, that the first issue is uh, a budget authority. Um, it's not authoritative. Uh, and then if you get over that hurdle, then the next question becomes, yeah, but it's not coherent, it just doesn't fit together. It's just a whole lot of bunch of text that's all contradict other text. And then if you can get over that hurdle and talk about it being uh, coherent, then the next question becomes, well, it may be coherent, but it's bad. Um, and then if you get over that hurdle, uh, then the question becomes, yes, but we can't apply it. And then if you get over that hurdle, the question is, well, yes, it is authoritative, it is coherent, it is good, uh, it can be applied, but you can't communicate it. Uh, into a secular public square. So, so these are basically the obstacles that we're going to try to address. Um, and uh, I'm going to stay on the subject of authority because I think it's the, the biggest one. Um, but then in this next half hour, I'm also going to move on to address those other problems of coherence uh, and virtue uh, as well. Uh, so where we left off last time, I was suggesting to you that uh, we think about the authority of biblical law uh, in terms of its uh, claims to reality that we are authorised persons because we're spreading that reality um, and uh, the question becomes how do we uh, do it. Um, and, uh, the, uh, and of course people are very afraid uh, of people talking about the authority of the book of law and part of the reason we have to recognise is because the world uh, has lots of ideas about what it means uh, by authority and if we're not careful uh, we will end up allowing the world's ideas, the culture's ideas about what it means to exercise authority, to exercise authority critically, uh, to shape the Bible's ideas uh, about the exercise of authority. And that's very problematic. Um, now, the problem is that we tend to uh, see authority primarily in terms of somebody exercising control over somebody else, and back to those classic uh, Austinian, Benthamite, uh, positivist notions of, of sovereign authority, um, bossing people around, compliant citizenship, um, issuing commands and rules, perhaps, as indeed is the case in a liberal society, uh, in a course of a manipulative way. Uh, and also uh, they fear um, that this is with a view to uh, promoting a personal agenda. So seen in this light, authority uh, seems very negative, uh, and that is what people naturally will tend to think of when we talk about the authority of biblical law. They think it's just going to be about a bunch of Christians throwing their weight around uh, and telling other people what to do. So um, I sympathise, I quite understand why that get, makes people nervous. But that's not the reason why we can't talk about biblical law and its authority in the public square. Because if it is the case, we are allowed for the fact that authority is context dependent, then we also have to allow for the fact that the Bible's ideas about authority and the exercise of authority uh, may be very different to ours. So we need to be open to allowing our ideas about authority to be remoulded uh, in the light of the Bible as a whole. And it's very clear that uh, ethical authority in the Bible is exercised very differently to modern ideas about authority. Uh, and this is another going to be another quick little whistle stop through some examples uh, for us, about maybe a minute on each of them. Uh, the first thing I want to say uh, uh, is that God's authority is exercised in a relational way. Um, clearly, the creation of the universe must be a spectacular display of divine authority. Um, God says it, and it's done. But, even in that, almost especially in that, this display of authority is exercised in a relational way. God speaks the word. The spirit broods like a mother bird over the face of the deep. It's all very Trinitarian. God the Father sends the Son, who is the word, the agent of the Father, in the power of the Spirit. The same pattern, in fact, that we find at Jesus' baptism, at the start of Jesus' public ministry. God the Father sends the Son uh, in the power of uh, the Spirit. Uh, God sends the Son, whom he loves. Uh, the Son wants to do whatever glorifies the Father, uh, while the Spirit brings life. It's a relational pattern of authority in which the Father works through Jesus and in the power of the Spirit. And this exercise of authority at the start of creation has what result? It results in the creation of a world that is teeming with life. Uh, and of course, God's 
exercise of authority in the Gospels remakes the world uh, and again brings uh, new light. So we learn that God's authority is exercised relationally and with loving engagement with his creation. Um, and that must be part of the model for our understanding of our exercise and projection of authority. Um, it's about enabling things to become the best that they can be. And in that sense, it's the opposite of what we fear. It's as far away from a top-down, legal, positivistic, controlling pattern of authority as it is possible to get. Uh, again, I emphasise the mode of the giving of the law at Sinai is the model. It's a model of, again, it's relational engagement. It's how the authority is exercised. Secondly, of course, uh, God's authority is exercised through uh, human beings. Sometimes, uh, you know, we uh, like to think that um, if God was really in control of things, uh, you know, he'd just suddenly appear in a, uh, you know, blazing glory and, you know, blast the opposition and sweep it all aside. Um, well, Jesus says if we want to have pictures of, not saying that well, we can't look forward uh, to the um, restoration of all things in the future, but Jesus says if we want to have a picture of what things look like uh, when God is in charge, then we should look at the parables. The uh, parable of the seed, uh, the seed that dies, that falls into the ground, uh, that grows slowly in the darkness. And so there is mystery here, there is weakness. Um, and there's not knowing and it's not being very clear. Uh, about what is actually uh, going on. Um, it's incremental, it's progressive, uh, and it's mysterious. Uh, and uh, God exercises this authority through uh, human agents, uh, anointed uh, and equipped uh, by the Holy Spirit. Um, and um, so it's not as if we are presented uh, through, uh, but because some kind of set of uh, timeless truths, uh, but individuals, um, think about uh, people like Moses or politicians like uh, Daniel, um, prophets like uh, Jeremiah and Micaiah, um, people who were called to put their life and liberty uh, on the line. Um, and uh, that too, of course, is part of the lesson of the Reformation, isn't it? There's something very incarnational about this uh, political engagement. Um, when God wants to speak a word of truth, he becomes like us. And that is part of the same picture of God's authority being exercised relationally. It's because God is relational that he wants to catch us up in the work uh, that he is doing. Um, and he is not going to bypass us uh, in our um, uh, desire uh, to um, seek uh, reformation uh, for our nation. Um, so in many ways the ethical authority of the um, biblical social vision is just a kind of a shorthand, not for the fact that there's a blueprint, I don't believe in blueprints, but it's kind of shorthand for the fact that God uses the Bible biblical law within the Bible as his means of equipping and calling the church to do those things which will bring radical healing to society and so bear witness to God's plans for creation. So God's authority is exercised through human beings who are called to live the story uh, of God uh, to the world. Um, this sort of anticipates what I'm going to say next about the issue about uh, coherence. How does all of this uh, fit together? Uh, and one of the things that I do want to emphasize uh, is the fact that law is fundamentally narrative uh, in terms of its um, construction. If you think about any rule, uh, you are dependent upon some kind, you know, you don't, you, don't you don't understand what a rule means because you know what the words mean. You know what it means because you share the underlying values. You understand what the values and hard cases in law arise when there is conflict about what those underlying values are. It's not about the meaning of the, meaning of the words. Uh, and we understand what values are as a result of our world here, as a result of the narrative, the sort of stories that we're telling about ourselves, uh, about our world, about our society. Um, and that's all true about biblical law. It's all true about the concerns, about the ethics and way in which um, uh, biblical law is, is, is taught. It's in narrative terms. 
Um, and so therefore, uh, when we, in exercising our authority as, as persons who live in the stories, who uh, think about things spontaneously in a narrative way, um, we can't just tell people what the Bible says. Uh, we have to do the things that make people ask, why are you doing this? And we'll know we're on the right lines uh, if it uh, allows us to then tell the story uh, of uh, what God has done and is doing and will do uh, in a work of uh, creation. Um, I'm a great fan of uh, Tom Wright's uh, teaching on this in his book on Scripture and the Authority of God. You'll probably be very familiar with this, the idea of the fifth act. Uh, that when we look at uh, the Bible, uh, we find that we've got um, the whole scope of biblical history uh, can be divided up uh, into a series of uh, main uh, acts. You've got the creation fall, uh, then you've got the story of um, Israel, uh, uh, and then Act 4 is uh, the story of Jesus, his birth, life and resurrection, and we are living in the final act, uh, the last days, as Hebrews uh, says, waiting for Christ's return. Um, and so our, our job is to do the things which are in long range continuity with the story. So, um, you, so he argues that, well, you've got a bunch of actors who are performing a, a five act play, but the fifth act's been lost, so what do you do? Um, you don't just stop, the end of, you stop at the end of act four, you want to see how the story goes on. So if you're a really good actor, um, you can improvise, you can get into the character, you can get into the story, and if you're, if you're with um, similarly skilled uh, thespes, um, you can improvise uh, the rest uh, of the story, knowing, of course, um, how the story is going to end, uh, which uh, we anticipate in, um, in, in the book of Revelation. Um, so the, the point I want to make is that, our, and this is actually kind of quite, quite a big theme, for me anyway, uh, that uh, what our job is to internalise uh, the wisdom uh, of biblical law, um, but um, because our responses are, our exercise of authority is um, creative uh, and narrative, um, we can, you know, there is inevitably going to be an improvisational quality uh, to what we do. Um, now, that's not to say that there aren't constraints. It has to be consistent with what's gone before, it's got to be consistent with what we know is coming. The alternative uh, is that we say, well, you know, it's just mechanical, it's purely formalist, we just sort of get on with applying rules, uh, and of course that, uh, again, is um, what, what people think of uh, when they talk about the application and the authority of public law. Um, I don't think that's right. It's not like that, and I don't think the Bible gives us, um, encourages us uh, to think along those kinds of lines. Okay, um, and, and of course we do need to, uh, to take into account the whole um, uh, biblical witness, otherwise we will get our application of, of um, biblical law wrong, uh, like some neo-apartheid groups, uh, we might try to base racial ideologies in scripture, or uh, we might end up getting tough on sexual offences, but uh, not on uh, anger or violence or the other way around, or we will ignore the biblical prohibitions and interests and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so we've got to uh, work in an improvised fashion in a way that's appropriate for this moment in long range continuity uh, and loyalty to what has gone before uh, and open to what must come next. Next point, uh, Jesus exercises authority from a place of humility. Um, the biblical exercise of authority is very different to the world's power games. Uh, we cannot establish the kingdom of God by statute. I'm not talking about theo tyranny uh, or that old favourite and over-realised eschatology. I'm not talking about that. But we think about Jesus' um, servant model um, of doing our work peaceably, without brutality, without arrogance. Uh, this is how, in the suffering servant passages, uh, we see God engaged in loving confrontation uh, with um, the world. Um, Jesus becomes king upon a cross, uh, and uh, all real authority is exercised from a cross because it is exercised from a place of humility. This must be especially true for us, we're not Jesus, we're prone to getting things wrong. Um, and as soon as we are given the responsibility, uh, as we've seen, uh, uh, to exercise authority, then the, then the temptation uh, is to uh, abuse it. So in as much as we want to hold up a mirror to power, we must also hold up a mirror to ourselves. 
to have even more cause to exercise authority uh, with humility. Okay, but having said all of that, we can't, as I said earlier on, we can't avoid the fact that we are authorised persons, um, but we do need to ensure uh, that we are exercising that authority um, uh, in, a, in an unappropriate way. So, um, so I think I said uh, about all that I want to say for now about the subject that we can talk meaningfully about the authority of the law and what we mean by its exercise. Um, and uh, I now want to turn to the question of uh, coherence, because people might say, well, uh, I can see that the Bible exercises um, authority, uh, but I just don't think the Bible uh, uh, fits together. Um, you know, uh, it's just sort of a mass of all these kind of internal ethical uh, contradictions. It seems to me that if we want to appeal to the Bible as a source of authority, then we have to take seriously the form in which that inspiration is given. In other words, its literary context and its presentation. And what we find is that uh, its authority gets expressed in a wide variety of normative ways. Uh, so my colleague uh, Julian Rivers uh, points out that, that when uh, the Bible offers its critique of materialism, uh, we find it uh, shot through a whole range of genres in the Bible. We find it in biblical law, critique of materialism, about uh, uh, what you should do if you take a neighbour's garment and pledge. I think about the wisdom literature, condemning the arrogance of attitude of rich people. In song and the Psalms, about you know, the, uh, the rich man and his pomp. In the prophets, about the commandment to, for example, rebuild the temple. Jesus' direct teaching, challenging materialism, his parables. Stories about the early church, like Amos and Sophia. Uh, and Sapphira, Paul's practical advice in Corinthians, uh, even apocalyptic literature uh, about the excesses of Babylon in Revelation 18. In fact, so many different genres all speaking about materialism, the one literary form that we don't find is a comprehensive ethical system about how we should handle material things. All right? So we're not going to find um, a uh, sort of a modern day abstracted um, uh, codified um, pattern or blueprint, which is what people claim that you know, people like myself who are advocating for the law are actually this is what we're talking about. It's not what we're talking about at all. It's recognizing uh, that the Bible's ethical concerns and public ethical concerns are expressed through a wide variety of genres which we must be sensitive to, but it's still nevertheless coherent. There's still a consistent critique of materialism, even though it's not dished up in the form of a comprehensive ethical system. Right? Um, so one of the things that we have to do in this uh, is to be able to um, do uh, justice uh, to the way in which uh, the texts are presented and learning to read things uh, in an integrated fashion. Um, because we have to deal with the Bible as it is. Um, if we're claiming that's our source of authority, we can't try to turn it into something else, because then we're saying that it's that other thing which is the source of our authority. So I'm very sceptical um, about um, those who want to apply biblical law in the public square, um, but who kind of work from a sort of methodological assumption that God's given us the wrong kind of book. So we sort of got to help God out uh, by you know, boiling off some kind of rarefied, uh, abstracted uh, set of principles um, which will then be useful because the Bible is not useful uh, in its present form as a source of public ethics. Um, uh, well, um, you know, I'm you know, down on that idea like a ton of bricks uh, because we're not, we have to take seriously uh, the way in which um, the Bible expresses its own um, concerns. Um, okay, um, so we don't find uh, laws in the Bible gathered together and all marked off in a kind of modern kind of uh, legal code. Um, we get a little bit of law, we get a bit of story, we get a bit of, you know, I mean, if you look at something like the Book of Numbers, I mean, there are, I don't know, I mean, Christopher probably knows, probably about a dozen different genres, you know, in, in, in one book. And we think about that as being a law book. Um, in fact, you know, I always think that biblical law is a bit like, you know, like a cake. If you're doing the bake-off 
biblical law special, you know, would probably be, you know, all of these different layers. You've got, you know, a bit of narrative, a bit of law, a bit of poetry, a bit of law, a bit of song, like the Song of Miriam, a bit of law, and um, all of that kind of thing. Um, and the Proverbs as well, here's an example, um, you like this. Uh, Exodus says, uh, and you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the officials and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. Proverbs says, these also are sayings of the wise, uh, partiality uh, in judging is not good. Not a great deal of difference in terms of the ethic. Um, very different genres. In fact, there's an argument for saying that Exodus is the more proverbial, it's the more proverbial form than Proverbs, despite the title, uh, because you get the image of, you've got an image in there of blindness, uh, for a blind, blind official. That's a bit more kind of a proverbial uh, thing. Um, so, uh, so to put it more technically, then my argument is that uh, what biblical law is, is an integration of different instructional genres in the Bible. Um, and we have to integrate uh, the material. Um, which, uh, and this integration, it is coherent, and it together expresses a, a vision of a society ultimately uh, accountable uh, to God. Um, and this is why I'm uh, grateful to be uh, thinking about the subject of biblical law in the context of a law school. People always think, again, split level, worldview, you know, uh, how, how can those things possibly mix? But um, I'm sure the other lawyers in the room will uh, back me up on this. Um, but um, the thing about law is that, um, you, of course, you have lots of different legal materials. Um, in that sense, kind of different genres. You've got different sorts of normative authority from different courts and decisions and common law and statutes and legislation and secondary legislation and all that kind of thing. And sooner or later, you have to you have to put it together. You just have to kind of make sense of it. And it's not the case that it all applies all the time. Okay. Um, so so there is a sort of there is a sort of a stance. That you have to take, where you have to, you have to, um, and this is where narrative uh, is important. Um, where you've actually got to construct um, a kind of a story about how it all actually fits together, um, and uh, that's that work of integrating uh, different um, instructional genres. Um, so uh, you will never hear me talk about blueprints and principles and rules and not to say that there aren't rules and there aren't principles. Uh, but uh, we cannot reduce modern law to that, and we certainly cannot reduce biblical law to that either. We have to take seriously the form in which it's given. Um, and when we look at the use of the word Torah uh, in the Bible, we find it is used of individual legal precepts that Moses might give. It's used to describe the outcome of judicial decisions. It's used of entire books, like Deuteronomy. It's used of all of Moses' teachings and instructions. Uh, Isaiah refers to it as to all the word of the Lord in Isaiah 1.10. Psalm 119 refers to it as all divine revelation generally. And Psalm 19 will tell us that Torah uh, just links up with the reality of all it is. It's just written into the fabric of the universe. Um, so the point is that the Bible itself um, even through its use of the word Torah, moves through all of these different levels, uh, from the particular to the universal and back again, by the way, modern law does the same thing. Um, and uh, so therefore, we have to be committed to an integrated uh, reading. It can't just be about this bit or that bit. Um, again, this is what people are, would accuse us of doing. Um, we have to be committed to making all sense, making sense of it. That also means that what we can't do is to start playing off, uh, and um, I'm calling out um, some theologians here, who want to just play off one bit of legislation against another bit called creation, or uh, the prophetic call to justice. So we can't talk about biblical law. You're barking up the wrong tree, they say. Um, but hey, let's go to those wonderful uh, you know, prophets, you know, like um, you know, Micah, you know, uh, and... and, and um, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, yeah, like, like, um, the, like the prophets weren't talking about law, that they weren't talking about covenant. Um, but, because, but we want to kind of play off uh, one bit against, against another. 
Um, I suspect that the reason why people are very keen on the prophetic call to justice is because we, can, we get the right to define what justice means. Okay, um, and of course in the beginning was the word, um, intelligence and therefore order. So God is a God of order uh, and so we must believe that the revelation that we have is coherent and has a consistent worldview. Right, uh, last comment. Um, uh, we might say, well, okay, biblical, be authoritative, uh, it can be coherent, uh, but, well, it's bad. Um, I mean, it could be like, you know, something like Mein Kampf or something. I mean, it could be coherent, but this worldview is bad. Um, uh, this is a, a very uh, widespread view, it's gaining a lot of traction here, it's uh, uh, Nikki Boll. Uh, the Bible of all books is the most dangerous one, uh, the one that has been endowed uh, with the power uh, to kill. Um, actually, I could spend the rest of the day just reading out uh, what um, modern theologians say uh, about um, not simply the Bible, but biblical law uh, in particular. Um, uh, biblical law is the whipping boy, uh, and uh, you know, um, and, and it's a um, uh, uh, and, and that's the area people want, want to come in hard. Uh, there was a, a writer um, who was actually a Chinese scholar, um, but um, who wrote an article over the last year. Um, he said, "Well, let's actually really try to be positive about biblical law for a moment." Um, and uh, 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 let's think of it as being, it could make a contribution, but it could make a contribution uh, in the same way that controlled substances uh, can make a contribution in medicine. Um, it's so poisonous, but um, you know, if you just sort of like morphine, if you just sort of introduce it in very, very minute uh, doses, um, it might actually, it could actually be beneficial, um, but that's only because it's toxic in the first place, it's so toxic. Um, no, um, you know, it's very easy to, I mean, I don't even mention these comments because uh, it's just so easy to knock them down. I mean, I mean why should the Bible be singled out as the big bad? But uh, it's easy to make these claims because it just chimes in with enlightenment rhetoric uh, which um, declared the Bible to be scientifically, morally and historically discredited. Uh, it seems that we are all good little Nietzscheans now uh, and uh, we believe that the Bible uh, is the uh, cause of the corruption and decline uh, of the Western world. Uh, and of course, um, uh, this all gets energised no end by the writings of people like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, who um, frankly just provides easy reasons for people not to engage with the Book or the Bible at all. We are not threatened by a God who is bad. But I think the time has come for us to be sceptical uh, about scepticism, and this same critique, uh, which focuses on uh, the nasty texts, uh, can equally be turned in on itself. We might as well just ask, well, if it's all about power projections, it's all Foucauldian, uh, and about interests, well, okay, then what interests are being served uh, by this insistence that uh, public law was bad? Uh, and to pretend to be detached uh, from biblical law might well be to declare that you simply missed the point and you failed to grasp uh, how influential biblical law has been over the last 2,000 years and why. And part of the reason uh, my objection to the language of texts of terror is that they prevent us from reading the texts in sympathy with their character. It simply doesn't explain why biblical law has been and still is an enormously formative influence. And I think as we come to this Reformation anniversary, um, we do well to reflect on the paradox that the Bible has been deeply influential on Western civilization, including law. And yet our assumptions are hostile to it having any influence at all. So we have to ask uh, what riches have we missed? We have to let the text be the text rather than make it say what we want. This means allowing uh, for ideas about justice and society in other times and other places to be radically different from our own. Otherwise, there was no uh, potential uh, to be uh, changed or to be challenged. And it seems to me that in making that move, we are intentionally leaving room for the fact that we will find biblical law offensive. 
And I think that the claim that biblical law is virtuous, after the manner of Psalm 119, does not deny that it is offensive in being inoffensive. Uh, interestingly, uh, when you think about Moses when he's giving the law in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 15.9, he anticipates that people are going to find it offensive. And he says, well, I, I know this is what you're thinking and this is what you're going to do, but I'm telling you that's the wrong way. You have a base, he says, you have a base heart, is what he says. Um, but he knows, even when he's giving it, that it's offensive. And if we ask the question, what is the most offensive verse in biblical law, I'm sure we'll have different answers. And I think those answers will tell us a great deal. It's not going to tell us a great deal about the biblical text. It's going, to tell, it's going to tell us a great deal about us. Because the fact that we are offended by something tells us about the norms against, we, against which we think that which we find offensive uh, should be judged. It also tells us the boundaries which we think should not be questioned and, by the way, where the lines of the modern establishment are drawn. And so the Bible verse that offends one reader may be a favourite of another who finds the fact that the first reader is offended offensive. But offensiveness is necessary if any text is going to survive. Uh, and to gain and retain the kind of cultural significance uh, that the Bible as scripture has maintained um, over the past 2,000 years. Okay. So, uh, after lunch, we'll move on to the next question, which is, uh, how can it be applied? Um, but before uh, we break for lunch, we're going to have another 10 minutes in groups of three or four uh, to think about uh, two questions, uh, either or both. Um, do I think that public law is in any way authoritative for the world? And do I find any part of it offensive?